everyone. Thank you so much. Um, just a quick note before everything sort of starts. We are recording this uh, event or meeting. So just uh, be aware of that. And uh, you know, if you need to turn your camera off or anything of that nature, please go ahead and do whatever you feel you need to do to make yourself comfortable and, and present and engaged um, with us today. Um, do we want to team? Do we, would we like to launch our poll questions? Um, yeah, Karen, would you mind? So um, welcome everyone. Before we get started and, and, and continue on, we do have some poll questions we'd love to ask of you. If you don't mind just taking a second, filling these out so we just get a little bit of a sense of who's joining us in the space this afternoon. That would be great. And I'm helping out with admitting Karen C, just so you know. Um, yeah, so just take a few minutes to answer the question, the two questions rather that you see in front of you. Thank you so much. It's helpful for us to know um, myself being from the School of Social Work and my fabulous colleagues at the Alzheimer's Association for Greater New Jersey. Who's in the room? So we can be as intentional as possible. Yeah, and feel free to say hello in the chat. We're monitoring all the things. Hi, Myrta. I'm so glad you could join us. And Dory. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Myrta, for sharing. Please go ahead and also feel free to um, answer our poll. It's also important for us to know in our future collaborations and planning and thinking about what structure or what content we'd like to continue to offer to, to all um, through the association, of course, and uh, Rutgers School of Social Work. So please feel free. I think everybody is pretty much answered. Oh, we're pretty wide across. We have some northern New Jerseyans. We have some central New Jerseyans. We have some southern New Jerseyans. So welcome. I know there's a little discrepancy between like northern and southern. I hear that. I'm not from New Jersey, but I always hear that sort of where's that line? But we're so glad that you could join us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, feel free to drop your own contacts. Robin has dropped hers. Thank you, Robin. I'm going to formally introduce everyone in just a second. Hey, Elizabeth, so glad you could make it. Thank you so much. Feel free to drop any information you'd like to share in the chat as well as ask questions throughout. We're really happy that you're here and we're really interested in hearing from you, um, the community forum, and I'll, of course, defer to my Alzheimer's Association colleagues here. But my understanding of a community forum is we care about the community. We want to hear from you. Um, you drive us and our work. And I can say that uh, on behalf of the school social work here at Rutgers as well. You all drive our work. Yes. And we have the wonderful helpline where you can get help. Yes. You can add your county. That's always a tricky one for me. There are many counties in New Jersey. <laughs> when des designing the poll, I thought, oh, I'll just list out all the counties for, for participants to click. And then I realized that that would be pro probably quite long. So thank you. All right. OK, so I'll share the results of our poll. And unfortunately, if anyone joins us, they won't have access, but they can join and drop in the chat, of course. So we have, um, and I know some have mentioned also in the chat that they're students and caregivers. We have some professionals as well and alums. So we're, we're really glad for everyone to be here and um, really happy to learn and know of the roles you've shared with us. There's so much intersection between all of them and, and all of us are community members really. Um, but it's just really great to, to know and get a sense of who's joining us this afternoon. So I'll go ahead and stop the poll, if I hit stop sharing, will that make the poll go away? I'm so bad at polls. I'm gonna, okay, well, 
So we see the results. Okay, so I'll click out of that. Okay, great. So I just wanted to very quickly just say, uh, my name is Dr. Lauren Seneker. I am the coordinator for the MSW Certificate in Aging and Health. I'm so glad that you're all joining me, uh, along with my fantastic colleagues at the Alzheimer's Association of Greater New Jersey. I'd like to welcome um, all of us to, to give a wave. I know each, each uh, person will be speaking, so they can share a little bit about their work uh, at that time. But we have Robin Cohn, who's the Director of Programs and Services. Can Rob give us a little wave? <laughs> Thanks, Robin. We have Karen Golden, who's the advocacy manager for the state of New Jersey here at the association. And we have Nicolette Vasco, who's not only an alum of the social work program here at Rutgers, but also the current program coordinator for the Alzheimer's Association. So welcome to our wonderful team. And we're so pleased um, to be here with you all today. So with that, um, maybe we wanna advance the slide. I think I'll go and I think my turn actually is now to talk a little bit about the certificate. Thank you. Um, so if you're not familiar, which I think most are on the call, so I'll keep this brief, but my email is here on the slide. Um, I am the coordinator for the certificate in aging and health. This is for MSW students. We do have post MSW certificates in aging and related topics through our continuing education department. Um, again, my, my email is there. Uh, I can send out the flyer and the brochure for the program uh, in you know, post-event communication to you all if you haven't had that already. And you can go ahead and advance the slide, Karen. Um, yeah, we can stay here. There's a little history about the certificate. Um, we've always been dedicated to working with older adults in their communities at the School of Social Work for a very, very long time, predating me and, and so many. Um, and this is just a little bit of information about the certificate in aging and health. I'm very proud to share that there are very close mentorship opportunities, not only with myself as a faculty member and a coordinator of the certificate, but also with uh, fellow staff and fellow faculty and even community partners like folks from the Alzheimer's Association here love connecting with our students, internships, guidance, guest speaking, um, all, all of the above. So I really am focused on providing that to students in the program. Of course, it's an opportunity to have an in-depth focus on areas of interest. Certainly your field and your education in the classroom will include some specializing in older adults and in healthcare and in their in those respective communities and areas of practice. And it's also an opportunity to specialize, right? So if you're if you're aware that you'd like to work with folks living with memory loss, or if you're aware that you'd like to work with folks who are caregivers, which inevitably many of us do become, um, please consider the certificate program. Please consider looking into the Alzheimer's Association's wonderful volunteering opportunities. If you're not getting clinical group experience, for example, but want to, there's an opportunity with the association to dip your toes into that work. And we'd all really greatly appreciate it. The community needs you. Um, so if you want to just advance the slide, Karen, thank you so much. And I'll just invite uh, my colleagues at the association to take it from here to deliver some really great content um, about the association and about Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, which is very helpful to start our conversation off about next steps and action and, and goals. Um, so take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for your partnership and for everyone that's here. Um, as Lauren said, I just finished the MSW program at Rutgers. Um, my name is Nicolette and I'm the program coordinator. Um, for me, it was really helpful um, working with the association because I was firsthand helping community members, um, families um, with support groups, with education, um, really knowing what they need and listening to their voices it helped me with my own internships as well, um, having that experience and, and learning how to um, hear multiple people from groups and um, listen, you know, closely to our families as they tell us, you know, what's important to them and, and really um, moving away from saying, you know, this is what I can provide to what do you need and how can I help? 
Um, so really important. We hope to hear from you today um, more about you know, what you've uh, experienced and, and how we can help your community and um, whether it's professionally or in your internships or as a student um, or as a caregiver as well. I saw quite a few of those. Um, but we're here from the Alzheimer's Association and our vision is a world without Alzheimer's disease and all other dementias. Um, we know families that need help. And it's, um, even though we're the Alzheimer's Association, there are many other types of dementia besides Alzheimer's disease. And we've recently changed that vision um, to include all other types of dementia because we wanna be here for those people that, that need it the most. Um, we can go to the next slide. And um, our time today, so we'll talk about um, clarifying terminology, so using to describe Alzheimer's and dementia. So oftentimes people use those words interchangeably. Um, they're not, in fact, the same thing. So we'll talk a little bit about the difference. And as I said, um, love to hear your experiences, those um, in your community, um, any type of needs, gaps and resources and opportunities that we see and share a little bit about our resources and how we can help you and your community getting involved as well. You can go to the next. Um, and thank you, Lauren and Rutgers um, School of Social Work for being here, for being a great partner. Um, and we look forward to continuing partnering in the future. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so a little bit about Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, so dementia is an umbrella term. Um, and we think of dementia um, as a wide range of symptoms. Um, so someone that's having cognitive difficulties and impairment um, may um, notice those differences. We can go back one. Um, and that um, there's many different types. So as you see under the umbrella, um, even though dementia is that umbrella type, um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common type. So usually that's why people are using the words interchangeably is because they've heard um, Alzheimer's so often. Um, they may not have heard of vascular or loop bodies or frontotemporal um, because you're seeing a much less um, rate of diagnosis um, but there are those as well. Um, most often we're seeing the vascular is someone that um, has had those heart difficulties and they are, um, maybe they've had a stroke, they've had difficulty with impairment and um, they're having some of those cogn cognitive, behavioral, psychological symptoms. We also notice that um, there's people with loop bodies and frontotemporal um, who are having some of the crossover symptoms we see with Alzheimer's or dementia, but it may be how they've acquired it, or it may be those symptoms that defer. Um, so really important someone's getting that, that diagnosis. That's really important. Um, so that way those treatments are um, affecting the people. They're getting the treatments that they need the most. Um, we do see those biological changes in the brain um, as someone has developed dementia and Alzheimer's. And as I mentioned, again, Alzheimer's is the most common type, um, which is why we're, we're hearing that word quite often. You can go to the next. Um, and we do know that um, there are a great deal of people at risk. So um, one in three seniors dies from Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. And this is someone that has the diagnosis. This is someone um, who there's so many people that we're aware of that you know haven't gone to the doctor, haven't gone to um, the physician and um, gotten that diagnosis and are affected. Um, so such a stigma and such a underrepresented number as well. Um, and we do see some correlations. Um, so we do know that age is the highest risk factor that we're seeing. So um, people over 65 are more affected, people over 85 are more affected. Um, so there is that um, as we're aging and we're living so much longer, we're seeing so many more people affected. We're also, we have a lot of more knowledge now. So um, we know that you know, someone, it's not senility, it's not hardening of the arteries, it's 
um, something much more and that eccentric person. Um, we know something's not quite right and more people are getting that diagnosis. More people are talking about it. We see in the media, um, Tony Bennett, we see Ronald Reagan. There's people that are open about their diagnosis, which really makes people more come forward and are willing to share their story, their experience. We also know that family history, there's a correlation. So more likely if someone in my family has been affected by Alzheimer's or dementia, um, there's more likelihood that I may be affected. We also know that heredity is a, a big piece. So there are those genes involved. And we do get asked that quite a lot. Um, what is the possibility? What um, are the factors? And we know that um, someone, again, who has a possibility of having the gene um, could more likely develop Alzheimer's disease or dementia. We also know that there are some factors that we can control, and that's really what we try and focus on. So unfortunately, my age, I can't control. I wish I could. <laughs> um, that family history, that heredity, Terry, um, you know, I'm sure we all wish there's certain things in our family that we wish we could change. Um, but I can control that when I'm in the car, I'm going to wear a seatbelt. If um, some young child is playing football, they're going to wear a helmet. Um, if we are riding a bicycle, again, wearing a helmet, um, it's really so important. Um, we see those boxers, those football players in the media now that long term, they're starting to see some really big side effects. So protecting our head is so important. And then those lifestyle factors are really important. So those are things that we talk about and we teach a healthy living program and really encompass, you know, Sleep is so important. Um, Robin has, has, um, is a research champion and has done a really great program recently on sleep and how much it affects our brain and how when we sleep, it really rids our brain of those toxins and how healthy eating is so important. So when we eat good, it fuels our body and it fuels our mind. And that physical exercise, getting that blood flowing, so important. We know that 25% of the heartbeat, the blood that comes out of our heartbeat goes to our brain. So if we don't have a healthy heart, if we're not taking care of that, um, then we're gonna have a really tough time having a healthy brain. And we've also found a lot um, about social stimulation, um, social engagement and cognitive stimulation. So really important, you know, we're doing those things that challenge our brain when we're in school, when we're reading a book, when we're taking a test or we're answering those questions on Jeopardy. It's not sedentary. Those are the things that challenge our brain, doing that crossword puzzle. I'm really engaging with others. Um, during this time, I know the past few years have been more challenging for people to engage safely, but just having, whether it's a Zoom conversation or a phone conversation with someone, staying that engaged is really important. Um, we have seen even um, history where people that are not addressing hearing loss, um, they're not getting enough stimulation because they're not catching all those words. They're not catching all that engagement. So really important, we're keeping up with our own health. Um, so that way we can try and avoid some of that risk as well. Next slide. We do know that there are populations that are disproportionately affected. So um, with many other illnesses, as we see, um, there's a lack of services, there's a lack of resources, um, there's a lack of people being diagnosed as well. So really important, we're reaching out to all communities. Um, we see that Black and African Americans are about two times more likely affected. Um, Hispanic Latinos, 1.5. Um, more than whites um, have Alzheimer's and dementia, but they're less likely to receive that diagnosis. So really important, we're addressing those gaps in services and we're really reaching out to the community, whether it's in their own language or with their own physicians educating them, it's really so important that we, we start honing in on those gaps um, to reach everyone that needs us. Go to the next. This little bit about our facts and figures for 2021. So every year we come out with new facts and figures. Um, and again, these are just reported numbers. Um, so 
really high numbers we're seeing in different communities um, and really important. Um, Robin has been spearheading, working really hard that we are um, working with different uh, diverse communities and including everyone that really needs to be included because it doesn't help that we have a trial that um, just men that are white and of a certain age are part of it. Um, we need women, we need African Americans, we need Native Americans. Um, really, if everyone's affected, as with anything else, we need everyone involved. So we know that this is reaching everyone and this is helping everyone. You can go to the next. And there's a little impact on our caregivers. So we know that people age 65 and older survive an average of four to eight years after a diagnosis, yet some live as long as 20 years. And individuals with Alzheimer's will spend an average of 40% of their time in dementia, uh, the most severe stage. And in that severe stage, people really need around the clock care. And when we think about that, I can't stay up and care for someone else around the clock. So that means multiple people providing that care um, just so you can continue working, caring for other people in your home, so you can sleep at night. Um, so really um, impacts families in multiple ways, um, not just one person saying, I'm going to step up and care for this person. As the progression is going along, more people um, are involved in that care. And the long duration of the disease contributes significantly to the public health impact of Alzheimer's disease. And we can go next. Um, and then we also see, um, as we're speaking about Alzheimer's caregivers, um, they provide more than 40 hours per week of care. Um, so 73% are women. Um, so that's a huge number. And women that are caring for themselves, doing their jobs, their children, their, their young families possibly as well. Um, I see um, more in the chat about you know, being part of that workforce and it is really a challenge for our families um, and definitely impacts everyone um, significantly. The next. Now I'll talk a little bit about the care. So um, we all know that healthcare is very costly. <laughs> Long-term care is very costly in hospice care. Um, and it's projected to increase to 355 billion in 2021, so more than 1.1 trillion in 2050. That's huge. Um, and this, you know, the, we teach a legal and financial planning class, and it's always a popular class because people want to know how do I get through this? No one's planned on having Alzheimer's or dementia, and now it's. I have to go into my retirement. I have to go into my savings. I have to. There seems to be no one. Uh, fits all answer. Um, looking into VA benefits, looking into reverse mortgages and, and Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so it's such a costly disease and so many people are having to pull different resources together um, just to afford that care. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague Karen, who's going to talk about public policy. Thank you so much, Nicolette, um, and welcome everyone. And uh, thank you, Lauren, for uh, and Rutgers for for hosting us today. My name is Karen Golden. I am a social worker. I am an MSW, and I am the advocacy manager for the state of New Jersey. What I'm going to talk a little bit about is how we um, shape and move uh, public policy, and I'm going to touch just at very high level um, some of the key pieces of legislation that we're working on on both the federal level and the state level. Um, I think as social workers, and I noted that there's a lot of caregivers on uh, this call, um, it's so important to know uh, what we're working on and how you can add your personal and your professional voice. So first, how we drive public policy. Almost all of the association's public policy work is conducted through AIM, the Alzheimer's Impact Movement, which is our 501c4 advocacy affiliate. Through AIM, we are able to engage in federal lobbying, state lobbying, grassroots advocacy work, and policy development. We um, AIM advances and develops policies to overcome Alzheimer's disease through increased investment in research, enhanced care and support, 
and uh, enhance care and improve support. And when I talk about the pieces of legislation uh, we're currently working on, you'll see that they neatly fall into those three buckets. We impress upon our elected officials the growing crisis that Alzheimer's uh, presents to our nation's families, um, to the individuals living with the disease, and to the economy. We want our leaders to take bold action when it comes to this disease. Much of our work is, uh, is grassroots, if you will. Um, it's done by our wonderful advocates. And I have to give a shout out to Myrta on the call. Uh, she, she tipped her toe into our advocacy waters right before our big national forum. So good on her being in school, being a caregiver and being an advocate. Um, we have an amazing uh, nationwide network of volunteer advocates who are all united behind a single cause. And that's our cause that uh, Nicolette shared earlier, which is a world without Alzheimer's or other dementia. It means educating um, elected officials, educating their staff, building awareness and advancing uh, critical policies. Ad advocacy for us is most certainly a verb. It is very action oriented. So what are we working on? Um, and I'm going to ask Nicolette if, when I'm talking if she could just pop into the chat the um, all's um, impact uh, 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 URL, the, the, uh, the website, because um, I'm going to touch on, uh, this on a very high level. Um, the first piece of legislation we're working on is to build a path to better dementia care. The, the name of the legislation is the Comprehensive Care for Alzheimer's Act. It's, it, it's a mouthful. Um, and if you think that's a mouthful, navigating the care system for an individual that has Alzheimer's is daunting. It's daunting for the individual. It's daunting um, for the family member. Why is it daunting? Because many individuals living with Alzheimer's and other dementia have um, very unique challenges. They have complex medical needs, uh, comorbidities. Um, they have non-medical needs. They, they need additional support uh, to live in their homes and to live in their communities um, to have help making a variety of decisions. But our healthcare system today currently does not pay for coordinated care. That's a wonderful world, uh, word in the social work world, coordinated care. That's what these individuals need, coordinated care. This bill calls on the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Intervention to implement a dementia care management model to, to test comprehensive care management. Um, we know and we believe this would be best for this community. Um, support for equity in Alzheimer's clinical trials. Nicolette did a wonderful job talking about the disparity, um, the, the disparity um, in terms of impact among um, certain communities. This piece of legislation would increase participation of underrepresented population in clinical trials by expanding education and outreach to these communities, include, uh, encouraging diversity of clinical trial staff and reducing participation burden. Again, speaking to social workers, it, we all understand we have to break down barriers in order for others to participate. Um, supporting our nation's caregivers. Uh, daunting task to be a caregiver, as Nicolette pointed out, 24 seven um, often. Um, for an individual that's living uh, with Alzheimer's and dementia. What we hear is um, it's a task that our caregivers want to participate in. It is very important to them. Um, they find it rewarding, but it is very taxing. Most importantly, they tell us they want to provide the care so they can keep their loved one at home longer. So what would this act do? This act would provide grants to certain uh, nonprofit organizations to expand training and support services for these caregivers, to provide them the necessary training so they feel empowered to take care of their, their loved one at home, and also provide them the necessary support for themselves so they can um, address those critical needs, both mental and physical health needs, in order to continue on this caregiving uh, journey. Um, the final uh, piece of legislation uh, that we um, are working on is uh, research funding. So an increased commitment to Alzheimer's research funding. 
Alzheimer's is the most expensive disease in America. And uh, Nicolette did a wonderful job um, sharing those numbers. By mid-century, the number of people living with the disease is going to triple and the cost to our economy are growing exponentially. Every year we, um, we support the National of Institutes scientists, National Institutes of Health, their scientists, the budget they send forward to Congress uh, for Alzheimer's research funding. It is critical. The key to, um, to finding that survivor, the key to prevention, cure, and treatment is going to come through um, this uh, incredible research that's being done. Um, as I mentioned, we lobby on both the federal level and we lobby on the state level. So here in New Jersey, uh, we currently have um, two bills that are making their way through the New Jersey legislature. And I, I would hope in a couple of months, I can tell you they have passed. Um, but the first is a uh, public awareness campaign. Um, it just absolutely makes sense, um, especially to those, uh, all of us on the call, that um, there needs to be uh, increased awareness, um, you know, in the community, early detection and diagnosis. Plus, we also need to ensure that our first responders, our, our EMTs, our um, law enforcement, um, our social workers have the adequate um, uh, and necessary training in order to effectively interact with individuals living with Alzheimer's and dementia. And um, the other piece of legislation on the state level is uh, the establishment of an Alzheimer's and dementia long-term planning commission. Again, it's to, to be forward thinking, to be proactive, to, to um, evaluate um, the way the state of New Jersey currently um, uh, manages um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia care, look at innovative ways, creative ways um, to, uh, to move that system forward. So we are positioned as a state to deal uh, uh, with this growing population. And with that, I will turn it over to <laughs> yeah, <to the> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we just want to cover a little bit of our resources that we can provide for support um, and for you, for your community, um, for you know, any of your um, contacts. We talk a lot about our sphere of influence, people that we touch daily that maybe um, we're not aware that they need support, they need help. Um, definitely something that we often don't go around sharing is that our family may be affected or that someone we're working with, someone we, we care about. Um, so definitely good to always know those resources that we can pass on to others. So we have a 24 seven helpline that I shared in our chat. Um, that number is 1-800-272-3900. Um, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a helpline. It's available around the clock. Um, so you can call at any point. It could be a holiday. It could be, you know, late in the evening and you just have a moment to talk. Um, and a helpline specialist who is master trained um, will speak with you. Um, it's confidential and they can provide resources. They can provide information, sign you up for a program, tell you where a support group is. Um, they are bilingual, um, so we also have a translation service that's in um, 200 plus languages, um, which is really helpful when someone can communicate in their own language what they are, their needs are and their concerns. Um, it is, um, there's live chat available and there's also um, TTY service that's available. Um, our next resource is our education program. So we have virtual and in-person uh, programs and support groups going on during this time. Um, so we know that not everyone may be comfortable. They may have vulnerable people at home. Um, so we're happy to connect just like this and um, present an educational program that may help you, um, your community members, um, whether it's you know, your faith-based organization or um, your group at Rutgers or um, maybe your, um, your neighborhood um, senior center or library. We're, we're happy to present a program on education and uh, much needed uh, pieces that uh, different families may need. 
We also have support groups. Um, so as many of us know, um, it's really important to have that support, peer-to-peer um, -peer exchange of information, those challenges, those possible solutions. Um, the education is key, but knowing that someone else understands, someone else is there too, someone's been there. And we have um, caregiver groups. We also have early stage groups. So for someone who's going through the journey and they're in an early stage to connect with someone else who's going through different challenges, um, different solutions and, and possibilities. And we're happy to do those virtually and in person. Um, they help caregivers work through those feelings, um, as well as people in the early stage share those coping strategies. Emphasizing the importance of maintaining our physical or mental health is really important. And at the bottom of the screen is our um, CRF, um, alz.org slash CRF. Um, this is where you can um, find support groups, education programs by just entering your zip code, which is really helpful. Our next resource that we have is actually the CRF. So it stands for Community Resource Finder. And if you type in your browser, all one word, www.communityresourcefinder.org, you will be presented with this page. Um, and you can pick different resources that you are looking for. So if you look in the top um, left, I had to think about it because I don't know my left from my right, is our <laughs> programs and events. And you can see um, programs that we are doing, as I discussed, or support groups. The really nice thing about um, this resource finder is you can find things you need in your community that we may not provide. So we don't provide transportation. We're not an assisted living or neurologists or elder lawyers. However, you can click on one of those options and it can give you again by your zip code, a whole listing of them, um, which is a really nice place to start since we don't have yellow pages or things of that nature anymore. Um, it gives you a, a population listing. And if you uh, know someone that you say, well, my grandma is not online, she can't search for her neurologist this way. If she can call our helpline, we would be more than happy to mail them out to someone that needs them as well. Um, our next, we're going to discuss a little bit. Um, we'd like to ask for your feedback. Yeah, thank you so much, Nicolette and Karen, for all of the content and information you shared. I was uh, pointing out certain things to um, students in the room, but also everyone in the room in the virtual space to learn about the wonderful resources that are free and accessible and available to caregivers, to students working in these fields. So often I can speak to my own experience as a nursing home social worker, being sometimes the only social worker in the entire building, needing that extra support and guidance, that education, calling the helpline, speaking with trained staff who are educated, who might be caregivers themselves, giving me great pointers and advice on how to interact and support individuals living with dementia or dementia-related illnesses, especially also their caregivers and communities. And also, quite honestly, how to help educate other team members on different approaches and strategies, um, you know, talking about other uh, team members who might ha not have access to this content and how lucky are we that we can access it all this afternoon and thereafter if we just pick up the phone to reach out to our wonderful team in New Jersey with the association. Um, so we're now at the point in the program where um, we're going to uh, invite everyone to comment as a group. Um, because of our size, I, I think, and I'll invite my colleagues on the line to confirm that we can unmute and, and speak to these questions. I think it would be a great dialogue. We are both uh, from the School of Social Work and from the Alzheimer's Association, very interested in hearing from you. Um, we're all, you know, I'd say the four of us have been speaking since August, if you can believe that, um, about how to deliver this information and also how to take next steps to continue supporting people doing this work continue supporting family members and community members that are supporting or living with dementia or dementia-related illness, and also laying powerful foundation 
a powerful foundation for the future. Um, so I want to direct us to our sort of first bucket, if you will, on the left here that talks about wins and losses. And as social workers in the room, but also as humans and, you know, just people, right? Um, caregiving or living with any type of memory loss can be complex. I like to use the word complex because there can be joy as well as the opposite of joy. Um, however, that is defined by you and also certainly full of twists and turns. So we're really um, encouraging everyone on the line if you're comfortable. You can drop it in the chat if you'd like, but feel free to maybe raise your hand or just sort of start speaking. I think we're a tight knit group, so we have Zoom etiquette. Um, can you share a, with us a win, a win through your experience perhaps with anything that we've discussed today? Caregiving, working in this field as a social work student, as a social worker or another provider, as a community member, as a volunteer. Let's hear from you. Let's hear from you if anyone has anything they want to share. A win. I can share, I guess, if you can hear me. <laughs> In the past, we can hear you. Thank you okay. so much. Awesome. Yes. Sorry. I'm at work right now. I'm on my lunch break, dinner break, whatever oh. we call it. So if there's like oh. a weird echo, I apologize. We're so um, happy to be here. Thank you. Yes. Yes. No, thank you for this. This was wonderful. Um, I think for me, the first thing that comes to mind, I used to work in clinical research with dementia patients. Um, and the reason I actually got into social work was because I started going to the support groups for caregivers that was led um, by the staff social worker. Um, and it was just like such a powerful and like positive experience. Um, you know, just to see the way the people connected and like were able to talk about their highs and their lows and like you could just see how much it meant to each person who was there. Um, so I think definitely like the community um, and specifically like, you know, support groups um, is just so important and so powerful. So I appreciate that it was brought up here and I definitely think that's like a, a win on the whole. I hope that answers the question well. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Annabeth. Yes, it's definitely a win. I wrote sort of seeing support groups in action um, because it, it can definitely provide so much membership and commonality and, and validation and resources and education as someone who's facilitated support groups in the past. Um, so much of what I observed as a social worker doing that is also not only sort of the emotional validation, but also education, resources, sharing what worked for them, what didn't work. And, and that's sort of seeing, you know, caregiver support groups or support groups in general in action, which is definitely a win. And Mer thank you so much. And Myrta shared that um, her mother-in-law can remain in her home surrounded by family because we have resources to care for her. That's wonderful. Really glad as Nicolette is saying um, that these resources were available and that they provided your family options. Absolutely. I wonder if anyone else has a win that they'd like to share in the context of our discussion this afternoon. Did I miss something? Everything was really silent and I was just away for a second. <laughs> Hi, Myrta. No, you didn't miss anything. Um, we were doing, dem I was demonstrating the efficiency of a true social work pause. <laughs> that <laughs> like probably a lot longer, but it was literally under a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, Robin, thank you so much. It's making a difference in someone's day. Absolutely, in someone's life. Thank you for providing that context and I couldn't agree more. And I think everything that everybody is doing with their work, 
being here is a win. Um, and I also think that uh, our collaboration as a school of social work and an institution like the Alzheimer's Association, not, an international group, I, I see that as a win. Um, that we're collaborating in this fashion. Karen, can you go backwards? I think we advanced by accident on our slides here. Okay, great. Just need to go back one. Sometimes when you're sharing, you can't see the back button, right? I have gremlins in my computer. <laughs> well, yeah. Did anyone else want any uh, any moment to share any other successes or wins? I felt like today, um, so I, I was on two programs um, helping our families. And I felt like it was a really big win. We just, right before the, <laughs> this form, um, we, we finished um, discussing a middle stage with um, our families and our caregivers. And there were so many questions and I felt like it really resonated with those families and the topic was so important to them. And it really um, brought about good conversation and suggestions from each other. And I think learning from each other and being able to help each other um, feels like a really big win. Absolutely. I'd like to share a win. <laughs> Because often my our, our wins in, in the policy and advocacy world, um, you know, we wait a long time for those wins. Um, but yesterday I was out at a community event and, um, you know, uh, it was it was a congressional event. But afterwards, someone uh, came up to talk to me and um, this woman shared that her mother was finally going for um, a much needed cognitive assessment. And um she started to cry and um, she was having a very um, challenging time articulating what she was feeling and was concerned because um, mom's English was limited um, and she felt her English wasn't as good as well. And she needed help formulating the questions um, to, to have um, for, for that provider because um, she was, she's convinced that, that mom has, um, has Alzheimer's and it was wonderful to be able to give her the not directly solve the, the issue, but give her the helpline number and assure her that, that that phone would be answered by a trained provider who could speak to her mom and her um, in a language that they were comfortable with. And she would be armed with the questions in preparation for that meeting. And I thought that was a huge win. I, I, I felt it was a win in my head. It was a win for what we do um, on a regular basis. But um, but for this community member, it, it was everything. I mean, it, I watched peace kind of come over her face when she realized that she would be able to talk to someone and, and get the help she needed. So that was my win yesterday. It actually was, it probably made my week, if not my month. Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you. I'm so glad you were there for that individual, a safe space to talk. That's definitely a win. And not that I'm, you know, the judge on wins, but I think we all can agree. Um, and Lizette, Lizette, excuse me, shared in the chat too, that she's, uh, that they are completely new to everything and uh, all the information we've shared and now feels like they know a lot more. So that's also a win. And that's really great, Lizette. We're so happy to hear that because when we started talking about a community forum for students in the fall, we really were passionate about educating not only students, but community members across all different systems. Um, but certainly as a, a person um, as a person who's on faculty and staff here at the School of Social Work, I kept thinking, gosh, you know, I worked in nursing homes and in a variety of different systems and settings that worked with individuals living with dementia, who were approaching diagnosis, who were caregiving. And I was thinking about how we were preparing MSWs um, with this content. And not to plug, but with the Aging and Health Certificate, 
uh, program, there is opportunity to learn more in these classes. But of course, not everyone is committing to a certificate. Not everyone can um, accommodate that in their um, MSW program. So the idea of the forums uh, sort of developed a little bit more from those ideas on how we can get information out. Both Robin and Nicolette and Karen and I are just very dedicated to educating as many people as we can about resources available for them. Um, because it, it um, although we're focused on wins, we can also kind of shift our gears a little bit and think about losses and also sort of what's not working. Um, because we know that that it is very much also a part of the caregiving experience. It's also can be a part of the uh, experience of living with memory loss in general can be lonely for a variety of reasons. So we all are also very interested in knowing a loss that you've maybe experienced and please share accordingly to your own comfort, but also additionally sort of what's not working. You know, we talked about caregiver support groups and seeing the work in action. Is there something that anyone um, has experience with that um, hasn't been working or that we need more of. Um, I know particularly my colleagues at the association are very interested and in, in committed to developing new programs for community members. And they work fast. They work really fast. So please share with us. Thank you, Marta. Thank you so much for sharing that. This feeling of losing your freedom. Yeah, being able to kind of come and go because you're now responsible for, for not only yourself, but someone else, which can include lots of joy and lots of opportunity, but also can include a lot of challenge and struggle and negotiation. Yes, absolutely. Anything else anyone wants to share? Thank you, Myrta, for your bravery. Yeah, Nicolette mentioned the loss of, during the pandemic, right? I think of um shutdowns you know businesses and organizations and community um organizations particularly everything went online not only are we talking about populations that may not be able to work they're not dig digital natives for example but also equity not everyone has access to wi-fi smartphones laptops um, they may be very sound in technology but simply not have those access uh, that access um, visitation. I also think about visitation and settings and, and the impact that has created for, for folks living with dementia, concerned about memory loss, um, caregivers as well, not being able to rely on those supports that once were there in person. We have great virtual support, um, but for some, it doesn't feel the same. For others, it can work, but not for everybody. Anything else anyone wants to share, particularly what's maybe not working? We do want to know that. Feel free to drop your comments in the chat or unmute. We'd love to hear from you. Alternatively, is there anything that you're using, whether you're a caregiver, a student, a professional, or all three, community member, volunteer, is there anything that you're engaging with that you'd like to share that has been positive in some respect, a resource, type of intervention even? Want to hear from you, so definitely feel free to share Drop anything in the chat. Thanks, Myrta. Music. Yes, music. I think we can all agree that music has profound effects on our mood. Um, it can also be an opportunity to reminisce. 
So for my caregivers on the line, it's an intervention to reminisce, talk about memories, um, give the opportunity for someone living with memory loss to narrate a, their life story to you. Um, and it can also, of course, just create a positive mood if it's a happy song or it, again, kind of creates a, a memory. Um, it also could be a wonderful, for any clinicians in the room, a very wonderful opportunity for intervention with respect to um, reducing any other types of intervention. So there's um, something called, well, there's a documentary called Alive Inside, and there's a program called Music and Memory, and these are real live programs, and they're opportunities to receive free donated iPods and connect and have these um, resources available for folks living with memory loss. Um, and for caregivers, matching pajamas make nighttime rituals fun. That sounds wonderful. That sounds wonderful. Myrta, you are such a dedicated caregiver. I just am so in awe of all that you do. Thank you so much for all that you do. And for everyone on the line, even just for being here, I know it's cold and it's winter now and it's just a hard time all around for many many reasons not just this season but i really do appreciate and i know my colleagues at the association appreciate everyone being here thank you so much i'd like to now invite anyone to share a goal so um, setting goals as we've written here can help solidify hope and motivate for change no matter where you are. Oh, thanks Nicolette for those resources on music. Appreciate that. Um, so no matter where you are, goal setting can be inspirational, can be impactful, can help drive change not only in your personal life but for the greater good. Um, so we're wondering what could you do after this meeting that might contribute in some capacity? What would you be interested in doing? And you can drop that in the chat and you can also feel free to just unmute yourself and share. What action steps or what what is something maybe that you can do? You know, we we attend maybe events and webinars and we get great content, great information, and sometimes it can stop there. We're encouraging us all, us included, to think about what next step can we take um, that will help create change in a way that's meaningful to you. Um, I will share that I will continue and I hope I can continue to collaborate with my fabulous uh, contacts here at the association to continue delivering really important information to not only social work students, but everyone, all of the social work community here at Rutgers and beyond. I've worked in these capacities for years. I know what's available in training and not. So much is on the job. Let's change that. So I'm appreciative and I am committed to continuing to collaborate and deliver content um, to the community. New, um, yes, Myrta says delivering information and new research. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's opportunities to do um, any sort of volunteering, right, Nicolette? There's opportunities to do maybe educational presentations, um, other types of programming. And for the social workers on the line who would like to facilitate groups, maybe that's not possible at your internship or wherever you are in your practice, you like this, you like working with caregivers, there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity. Myrta shared normalizing the conversation of dementia. Myrta, can you share a little bit more about that? We'd love to hear that. If you're in a place to unmute. Yes, I can unmute and I can do all of those things. Hello. Um, I think uh, in my family, we are affected by Alzheimer's on uh, many different levels. My mother-in-law is not the first person to be afflicted by this disease. Um, we have lost a family member and we have one in a nursing home. Um, so I guess for me, it just makes me uh, fearful for um, the fate of my husband and his siblings. 
because it runs so rampant in their family. I'm sorry, <laughs> I get emotional. Um, but it's something that um, I think, especially the younger generation, my sister-in-law is showing symptoms of like early warning signs um, and she's in her forties. And I don't think it's something that she's even willing to talk about. And the more that I am educated, the more I realize that there are, um, you know, opportunities for uh, research and, um, you know, those kinds of situations that she could, um, you know, be involved in and that we can talk about it. Like there are medications all the time. There are new medications coming out or new, new, new resources, right? For lack of a better term. So I just wish that, um, for me, that's what my goal is, right? To normalize this conversation and let's just be free. Let's talk about this because it's obviously something that's running through their family and many others. Thank you for saying that. Thank you, Myrta. I, I just wanna thank you so much for sharing all that you have and we're here for you as a resource and support. And I couldn't agree more in terms of what you mentioned about normalizing the conversation, because maybe if we did normalize this to an extent in, in common verbiage and, and, you know, we don't talk about these, these are like the taboo topics, right? In practice and community settings, um, you know, my partner always says, like, don't stand next to Lauren at a party because I am that person. Um, but I think that it is so, so important because maybe it will help shift the mindset of society and more change will come if we're in a different place and space about the onset of memory loss. I find in my own clinical practice that so often we have a uh, for lack of better phrasing, a memory of what it's like to live with dementia or dementia-related illnesses from the past. And we've come so far in our practice, in our person's first language, in our policy, and we're still going for in, you know, a positive future, you know, onward and upward direction. But I find that so often our uh, clients and individuals, family, friends, everyone really do hold on to these sort of dominant narratives of the experience. And it's, it's, it's challenging, right? Because we struggle with sharing the realities and then also kind of helping to shift those narratives and understandings. And I know um, colleagues at the association probably um, work in this sort of dance probably quite a bit, quite a bit. I think um, a lot of our families are, you know, struggling with the conversations um, and meeting people where they're at because, and I never use that term as much as I do now in social work, but um, just really, you know, it's okay if we don't want to use the word Alzheimer's or dementia, but it seems like you're struggling with X and let's, you know, talk about that. Let's get you help. Let's um, you know, whatever they're willing to admit or have that conversation around so they can get help, I think is really important. I think there's a lot of room to grow even in the physicians and professional area. Um, I personally, my family um, has been affected twice as well. And um, I can recall being in the ER and the doctor saying, well, um, you know, you, you're unaware, you know, sundowning, kind of dumb, dumbing down, mansplaining, some sundowning to, to my family. And at that point, it was really a late point to the, um, my grandfather only passed a few days later to talk about sundowning at that point, really wasn't the point. And I said, you know, I know what it is. I work for the Alzheimer's Association, but it really was a lack of education for my family, um, I really felt like there could have been so many conversations of resources, support, things that we've been talking about today that could have been provided earlier to my family. And if I didn't work for the association, I wouldn't have known them. And I think a lot of families are in that situation. So I think having the conversations not just that are so important, just even within the family or on professional levels as well, um, that's the only way we can help people is talking about it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And for everyone who's sharing, um, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, something to add to those experiences is, is simply realizing and um, being patient. You mentioned, I've never mentioned more like meet clients where they are until now. And it's so true. It's so true. And we think about this when we're working with clients who are living with severe levels of anxiety or other mental health disorders for my social workers in the room, DSM related disorders, right? Things that we study. We, we recognize the importance of developing a therapeutic alliance and rapport. We pace our interventions and our strategies according to the person. That should not change because dementia is present in the room, not only for the person living with dementia, but also the caregivers. You know, sometimes we have like the problem solving bug where we wanna give resources and we wanna connect everyone to all the good things. But simultaneously to that, we have to tap into the emotions, realize that maybe they didn't make that call yet just because they're still feeling the impacts of this diagnosis or this disease process from wherever you know location the person is. I always used to say that there's there's not just two, but when I was working in 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 nursing homes, I would say that there's sort of like this practical side to caregiving specifically where we're identifying resources, we're thinking about, you know, different programs that are available, but there's also the emotional processing side. So it's like the practical and the emotional, and they intersect quite a bit, but um, it's certainly, you know, if someone is uh, going through some sort of loss, ambiguous loss because the person is still living or loss because the person has died, we have to recognize that that could impact behaviors and also willingness to reach out and support. And that's why the association is so wonderful because they know this, they are this, they have this support built into everything that they do, their research, their programs, their helpline, even planning this event, we thought so intently about what we were going to share, what our goals were, and how we could help. Um, and, and I really appreciate everything in the chat, compassion, yes, absolutely, support, um, and resources. So I really thank everyone for the conversation. It's been really meaningful for all of us. Um, I'm going to suggest that we move forward. Um, and thank you so much. I'll turn it back over to Nicolette. Thank you for this conversation. I think Nicolette has some additional information to share about resources and also diagnosis, which is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so about your community. Um, so we'd love to support people more in your community. And I know that you started the conversation about um, we started the program um, kind of saying, where are you? Where are you located? Um, whether you are in Northern Jersey or, or South or, or that middle portion, um, we would love to help. And are there ways that we can help better um, where to reach people? Um, so where people are still assembling during this time or where people are, are using Zoom, where they're gathering, um, we, um, work with a lot of communities and, and we'd love to hear from you um, kind of where you feel like there could be a good place to support people better and reach out. Well, I'm thinking about how many times I've been to the neurologist with my mother-in-law and the doctors never, ever like offered up any resources like, you know, Alzheimer's support groups or anything like that. I wonder if that's something that we could tap into. Thank you, Myrta. Yeah, that's really good to know and, and an opportunity, particularly for um, team members from the association here this afternoon to consider connecting with these spaces and with these um, providers and thinking about how that can happen. Absolutely. Lauren, it's Robin. I just want to add on, you know, to that thought. And I thank you so very much for bringing up a, a tremendous opportunity for all of us. 
I know for the last five plus years, the Alzheimer's Association and Greater New Jersey chapter have been, you know, slowly making inroads into clinical practices, into healthcare systems. And, you know, after five and a half years, Nicolette and I, you know, speak often about, you know, how can we really garner and mobilize all of our healthcare providers, our allied care professionals to talk about the Alzheimer's Association, just like they talk about a cancer diagnosis, for example. You know, we, we know through family, through friends, you know, and, and perhaps even ourselves that, you know, once you're diagnosed, you know, you are provided with a, um, I would say a cancer navigator and or someone that is so helpful in just coordinating your care. And what we find is that the more that we inform, the more that we educate our healthcare providers and our healthcare systems, you know, the more of an opportunity we have to extend reach of our services. So I just want to say that we are very engaged with our healthcare systems from a community education perspective, but there's a lot more that we need to do. And we look forward to you really joining, you know, our volunteer efforts to be able to bring more resources and information from the time that you enter a healthcare system until the time that, you know, certainly, you know, you are discharged and, and going home. And even for out of, you know, hospital services that, you know, same day services, we have to do a better job of getting those resources into every port of entry. Thank you. Karen, um, I don't know if you saw the chat, but there's a um, comment from Elizabeth about the United Way um, Caregiver Coalition. And I know that you are familiar with them. Did you wanna talk a little bit about their connection, your um, interactions with them and how they might be helpful? Yes, and that's a wonderful uh, suggestion, uh, Elizabeth. I, uh, and we are connected with them. That's a, that's a partnership we would love to grow. I'd be interested in hearing uh, your work with, um, with the Caregiver Coalition. I think that may be helpful. might be typing <laughs> yep, no that's okay <laughs> so i know i do know um I, oh. uh, immediately prior to the pandemic i had become connected with the the caregiver coalition i know i believe robin is very familiar as well meets in uh several of um has um several county caregiver coalitions um particularly in uh north jersey and um uh yeah robin's mentioning that uh that we're holding a special caregivers coalition um, across the state on December 9th. Um, yes, I just want to add on that we're holding a community convening of all the caregiver coalitions across the state. This is in partnership with the State Department of Human Services and all of our partners. So as soon as we have that program flyer available, we will make sure that, uh, Lauren, that you receive it and all participants and registrants receive that as well. Sounds wonderful. And and thank you for your your comment, uh, Elizabeth. I see, I, trust me, I understand not being able to uh, mute and unmute. Um, you, I, I agree, I've sat in, again, pre-pandemic, um, several of their meetings. It's a great uh, gathering of, um, of not only caregivers, but um, individuals that touch that space from uh, from a variety of for-profit and not-for-profit uh, organizations. So definitely something um, I think we um, need to continue to foster those relationships. Um, excellent suggestion. We wanna switch to the next slide. Um, I think there's another um, community question that we'd love to ask. So um, we've talked a little bit about the physicians and um, the process of getting a diagnosis. Um, so 
We know that um, it may entail a physical exam, diagnostic test, neurological neurological exams, mental status tests, brain imaging, it should involve multiple tests. Um, so we're an advocate for, um, we wanna make sure that people are getting that um, adequate, adequate diagnosis. Um, I know that um, there's quite a bit of families that I've worked with before and they say, you know, they, they went to a doctor, they weren't really comfortable with their answer or they weren't feeling heard or validated from their doctor. Um, and really important that people have um, adequate resources. Um, and if there are any inequalities, um, access to resources that you see based on where you live um, or obstacles, stigmas, reasons why people are not getting that diagnosis, if you would like to share or, or bring that about, we'd love to hear it. I, I wanted to share very quickly um, that I think that ageism causes a great deal of challenge with respect to getting um, a comprehensive and adequate diagnosis. I speak with students and in, in my own personal life with my own grandmother and, and others um, that there is sometimes, again, not generalizing in any way, but there are times where um, providers could be um, assuming that memory loss is part of the aging process. While we know that changes can occur as a result of aging, um, the onset of dementia, or Alzheimer's disease, or another dementia-related illness is not normal to the aging process. Um, certainly, age increases our risk, but it's not normal. Um, to develop Alzheimer's disease, for example, as we age. So I find that um, oftentimes, and I hear from students still and in my own practice, that this is, of course, still a concern that many are kind of looping in, and not just providers, even just family members, community members, you know, and in some cases, this can turn out okay. Um, in some cases, and for some individuals, there might not be any um, adverse outcomes to this assumption that it's because of age. But for many, it can be a struggle. And I also particularly think of folks living with young onset Alzheimer's disease prior to the age of 65 and how challenging that diagnosis, um, diagnostic experience can be because of the rarity of that diagnosis, but also, and I've chatted a few times this, um, impact of differential diagnosis for my social workers in the room, Nicolette, I'm pulling you way back, differential diagnosis, right? Is it dementia? Is it memory loss? Or is it depression? Depression and dementia can mirror one another, right? Um, we can feel a little confused, a little foggy, sleep too much, sleep not enough when we're feeling sad, right? Um, just because an older person is feeling this way doesn't mean that it is dementia, but we have to do our due diligence to make sure and I think that age does certainly cause um, some inequity and some challenge, ageism particularly. Sorry, <laughs> I feel like I, I definitely stepped into my <laughs> professor role there. Please, everyone else share. Thank you so much. Lauren, it's Robin. I just wanted to add on to that um, conversation about communications. I'm hearing from families about how difficult it is to have a conversation with their healthcare provider and care team. And just making it a little bit easier for families is something that we certainly want to be able to, to give to those families. You know, we spend so much time with our caregivers and really, you know, through our support groups, we practice how to have a conversation with your healthcare provider and also provide them with resources and tools, you know, telling um, families to journal every time that they see a sign or symptom, right? And then be able to report back to their healthcare provider team and advocate for themselves. It's so important, no matter how old you are, to be able to advocate and gain that respect. And, you know, we also say there are other neurologists, right? So if this particular, you know, neurologist is just not right for you, 
then, you know, let the Alzheimer's Association help you find someone else, right? So, you know, we could be there as a support base or just to talk things, you know, through to for families. Thanks, Robin. I'll also add just even for social workers and practitioners in the room, when a family or someone is, you know, a client is coming to you and explaining their experience with a neurologist, let's say you've never really had this experience in practice, you can call the association and, and talk about what's been happening with your client in an anonymous and secure and protected way to understand is this sort of what I should be advocating for my client? Um, or maybe there's something else that I, I could offer. And, and perhaps I'm new to the field or I'm just not sure of the resources out there. So I am just so passionate about making sure that folks on the line know that the association is not only there for community members, individuals concerned about memory loss, or individuals living with memory loss, caregivers or those impacted by this diagnosis or these diagnoses, but also for providers and practitioners and clinicians and all the like who are working in these fields, who have passion, but perhaps not all of the knowledge just yet or education just yet. Um, and so much is on the job, but the association is there to help. And of course, at the MSW program, we're, we're here and we're also doing our best to prepare you and have those transferable skills to work in these um, areas as well. I think Marta brought up a good point about language barriers. So um, it's an obstacle Robin brought up. We've, we've been at the association uh, five and a half years and neither of us speak Spanish. And um, I'm ashamed to say that when I would go to a health fair with pamphlets that we had in Spanish. I had no idea what they said. Um, I couldn't translate it to you. But we have now volunteers in various communities that are running support groups that are in multiple languages. We have um, programs now that Robin's presenting in Mandarin and we have in Spanish. And they're not just someone translating them in those languages, but they're written in those languages, which is really exciting. And now that we have educators and facilitators that they're not just translators, but they're trained people in um, the community that have that vested interest and um, are really excited to bring that to individuals. Um, I think the big gap that we see is the lack of awareness is um, are those communities that need those services, are they aware of them? Um, because we, we don't see a huge um, attendance in those areas. So definitely something that um, I'm really excited about working on further in the future to um, engage with communities that really need them and can help us. I would just add really quick to what Murda said and what was confirmed yesterday when I had the conversation with our community member that um, uh, the lack of uh, practitioners that are bilingual, um, um, shocking in, in, in northern New Jersey. And, um, it, you know, as we know that it's so important, as you said, to, to, to meet uh, the client where they're at when you're having these kind of discussions. Um, so important to be able to do that in a language where one is comfortable. Um, and that truly does present uh, a barrier to, uh, to diagnosis and a barrier to care. Um, and Karen, if you want to switch to the last slide, um, we can um, <laughs> just ask um, the following question as we, we wrap things up this evening, um, that, you know, we value your input of what you think is best to help move our organization, reach more people, serve them better. Um, so if there's anything, as Lauren said, that you think would be helpful for us moving forward to, to do that, um, we'd love to hear it. And, and um, any other thoughts that you may have.
Just doing that good social work pause. Believe it or not, that was one minute. I know we have trouble with pauses still. Um, Please feel free to drop anything in the chat about Nicolette's question and helping us understand what we can do further to support you. And not only is that an invitation to discuss about programs and different opportunities the Alzheimer's Association for Greater New Jersey chapter can do and all of the folks on the line um, from the association, but also the school social work here at Rutgers. Um, again, I'm a faculty member. I'm also the coordinator for the aging and health certificate program here at the school and I'm very dedicated along with my colleagues at the association to helping educate and connect and support individuals impacted by dementia or dementia-related illnesses in any which way. Um, I love our collaboration um, and I think it's powerful as to systems in the community that can help create and affect change. And we can continue to do that as, um, as long as we hear from you and connect with you. Um, oh, Myrta has her hand raised. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I was thinking about uh, my mother-in-law used to live in a, um, I don't know what you call them. It's just like an adult building, I guess, over a certain age. And they have like a social worker on staff in those buildings. Does um, Alzheimer's organization um, visit those buildings and provide resources to those people? Because that's like a captive audience. And a lot of these people don't have access or knowledge of, you know, working knowledge of the internet. Just wondering about that. I'll start, uh, Myrta, just by answering that the Alzheimer's Association welcomes the opportunity to provide uh, education programs and support groups in all or, you know, all organizations, all public housing communities, all, you know, communities and residences. As a matter of fact, we spend quite a bit of time, you know, educating um, all communities, you know, in the homes of where they live, not per se in the home, but obviously, you know, in a public environment, you know, where people are gathered, you know, such as, you know, the community rooms and, you know, different locations where people feel comfortable. It's really important that we, you know, are able to know where families are and how best to inform and educate um, and meet them where they are, right? So that's so important to the work that we do. And we welcome the opportunity and, you know, to be able to bring our information resources and have a community conversation with families where they are is exactly where we want to be. Thank you. Nicolette, do you want to follow on on that? Yeah, um, I think um, we have, um, I've, I've worked and Robin has as well, um, worked with a lot of senior communities, um, assisted livings, adult day, nursing homes, what have you. Um, during this time, it's been challenging. They were hit so hard with the pandemic. Um, we did work with a lot virtually, um, but then also comes in, you know, those, those struggles that Lauren mentioned where you know, who has access to the iPad and who knows how to use the iPad and, and all of those things. Um, so we're definitely um, back in community as well as virtually right now for those locations that um, are allowing us to visit. Um, I think they're, you know, rightfully so trying to be cautious um, during this time, um, but definitely just providing those resources and that information is something that we're happy to do and um, send them to anyone who, who may need them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marta. I don't know if there's like a specific, I, I work with so many students and, and smaller, um, um, organizations that are working in these spaces. I don't know if you want to privately email me like the particular residents that you have experience with so that I can share with our team here at the association so they can maybe do some targeted outreach. Because odds are, if you're thinking that maybe this isn't happening, you're probably right in some way. Um, it's hard to get into every space. Certainly with supportive housing as well, it's tricky because you know, there's different programs and different leadership with each program. Um, so if you have any references for the association, um, 
colleagues, uh, please feel free to maybe reach out to me privately. I'm happy to forward it along because this is a really great opportunity for action step when convenient for you. We know you're balancing all these different roles, of course. Yes, sure. I'll um, I'll send you an email later with the uh, address. And yeah, oh, please, anytime. I, I'm yeah. sure the colleagues here from the association are really interested in connecting with communities that are in need and that are not getting access. Right. Well, Chance, I mean, it's possible that they're already in there and um, I just wasn't aware of it um, because when she lived there, obviously I wasn't so hands-on as I am now. Right, right. But thank I would you so invite much. anyone to, you know, if there's a church, if there's a school you belong to, obviously workers, um, if you, there's a, um, you know, senior uh, wellness center, there's a library, um, a women's group, a rotary club, um, various different um, organizations and assemblies of people were happy to um, be part of and um, outreach to and just because we have outreach in the past, there doesn't mean there's not an opportunity to connect. Um, a lot of times staff changes over and we've all been through the pandemic. So um, definitely opportunities always in the community to um, establish or reestablish relationships. We'd be happy. Absolutely. And feel free to uh, be creative about those connections. Um, you know, those settings that Nicolette mentioned are definitely important, but thinking about other settings that just have high traffic are, you never know. I mean, it's always true. We just simply never know what someone is going through. And um, sometimes having a flyer for the association, for example, at a bus stop could be life-changing for someone who's just commuting in and out and, and you know, living through other experiences that relate to what we discussed tonight. So be the change. <laughs> yes, and Nicolette um, and Robin just put their contacts in the chat. So you can definitely feel free to keep in touch with all of us about ideas or needs or concerns, support or anything that comes up. We're so willing uh, to keep in touch, absolutely. So I think um, with that, is this our last, do we have another slide? No, that's, that's okay. all. Okay, great. Great. Well, I want to, um, actually, Karen, do you mind uh, stop sharing? If you can stop. Great. Now we can kind of see each other. Um, feel free to flip your camera on only if you're in a space that permits and in a mental and physical space that permits. Thanks, Myrta. Um, I always tell my students that no pressure, I understand. Um, but thank you all as Robin is sharing in the chat. Oh, and when Karen shared her email too. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, thank you so much for everyone joining. Thank you to my wonderful colleagues at the association. I'm so thankful for our collaboration and our continued partnership. Um, we really hope to have a similar event or an opportunity to learn, connect and educate one another in the spring. So keep an eye out for that. We have it on the docket. Um, and I wanna thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. I wanna thank Karen Crimmins from our school for hanging in with us and just being the master of tech ceremonies. Thank you so much. And um, again, thank you to all the participants. We really appreciate your voice, everything that you've shared, everything that you're doing, and we really hope to hear from you. So keep in touch. We'll be sending you some follow-up information, some, some surveys, some things, because we really care and we want to make change. Continue the work we're doing, but, but make change, um, because society is ever-changing. So with that, I want to just invite my colleagues to say anything they'd like to say or just give a wave. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It was a wonderful time being with you all. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a really good evening, a good rest of the week. Definitely stay in touch and you'll be hearing from us in sort of a post-event wrap-up message that will come to you in the next coming days. Thank you all. Thank Thanks you, Lauren. Thank you, out. Rutgers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all so much.